you, Jesus, God, for this opportunity, God, to learn your word, to study your word. We thank you for you, Jesus, and your word. And we cannot separate one from the other, for one is the other. We thank you, Jesus. We pray that this word would go into our hearts, strengthen us, draw us in and keep us, God. And maybe, Jesus, somebody we cross paths with, we can teach a Bible study to. We'll give you the praise, God. Touch every heart here. Touch me, Jesus. God, I need you. Everyone needs you. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the anointing of God. Lord, we'll give you the praise and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Start. Okay. This is lesson four, and it's to about starts with Moses and taking the children of Israel out of uh, Egypt. Now, I wasn't here for the other lesson, so I presume that Joseph's in Egypt. So, I'm just going to go to a brief thing here until I get straightened out. Joseph was put in Egypt. He was sold to by his brothers, as you've already know. But he was to save them from the famine that was to come. And it was for a safe place for the people to multiply. That's why they were there. That's why God, them, God put them there. And God, when he brought them there, he also separated them, put them in the land of Goshen because they were shepherds. And shepherds was an abomination. So not only did he bring them into Egypt and give them the best land, but he separated them from the Egyptians because the Egyptians was a, or the shepherds was an abomination. So he, he, he separated them. And besides that, if Israel had to stay, if, if the Israelis had to stay out of Egypt and survive, say they got over the famine, they probably would never have made it into the promised land because the, the land under Joshua when he went out was so wicked and it was offering babies to Moloch, the gods. All kinds of gods was there. All kinds of hideous things was being done. They probably alone could not have stood. So God took them out of that. And when he brought them back, he brought a great army that could stand them. And, we, and that's exactly what they did. Now, they made mistakes. And don't condemn the, the Jews because they made mistakes because we make mistakes. And we would have made mistakes there. Hopefully not as bad as some of them made, but anyway. Uh, okay, why did they have to go into hard bondage? And I'm going to cover more of this later. To strengthen the people to go to the journey. If you're working real hard, you can do a lot more than if you're laying around. I can tell you that. I snowshoe pretty every day. And it was, I've seen fellows half my age wear out half the distance that I travel a day. That's because they do it every day. If I didn't do it every day, I couldn't do it. And they had to make the people want to go. They had it made. They was in the best land. They was covering the whole land. They was multiplying exceedingly. In fact, there was more of them than there was the Egyptians. And... Uh, why all the signs that God put on them? Why didn't he just kill the firstborn, be done with it? Simple. Number one, according to Exodus 7 and 5, so the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Exodus 9 and 16, the earth will know that I am the Lord. And Exodus 10 and 2, that you will know that I am the Lord. Moses trained in Egypt, and he knew how to deal with the Egyptians for 40 years. He was raised by them. And then he was sent into the, into the desert, into Midian, actually, the Bible says, and was in the wilderness into the very place that he would eventually lead his people into. So God kept them. He knew how to deal with the Egyptians. And uh, there's more to it. I'm going to get into it here in a minute. And uh, i got to watch this, my charts. But uh, and he, he was in the Egypt, and uh, he was in the wilderness for 40 years, which he should have been, which it would give him great training. 
One thing I was doing this lesson, and I do a lot of research, and I read a lot of books, and one article I come across, it was naming all the, it was telling this story right here. But it went back and it said about Moses, and I never thought of that. He was in Egypt for 40 years. What did he do? He just didn't walk around. I mean, them fellows, he was pretty high up. His mother that raised him, or his stepmother, was the Pharaoh's daughter. And this article said that Moses, Pharaoh had ordered his daughter to release Moses to him when he was older and made him a general in the army. And actually, he was a general that fought against the Ethiopians. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's what this fellow said. They, they go back. So it gives you an idea what Moses, the training he had. So he wasn't just sitting around twiddling the thumb. He was busy. So let's... Uh, now let's look at them. Now, when the people became to be hard bondage, um, I don't want to go right, right there first. When, when uh, Jacob was 130 years old when he came to Egypt, and Joseph was a, in Egypt then about 22 years, he was about 39 years old when his father came. Actually, when Joseph was in Egypt, Isaac died at that time. And it's a great fun, it's just nothing to do with the lesson, but it's great fun to go back and put the timeline. Abraham might have talked to people that were the other side of the flood. When you get looking at people's time, it's just, I find that interesting. It's nothing to do with the lesson. <laughs> but now God has a problem. He's got to get his people out of Egypt. And uh, Goshen is not the promised land. It might be good, but it's not the promised land. It's not the place that he told Abraham, I am going to give you. And he was going to keep that promise to Abraham, and he's still going to keep that promise to Abraham. That never changed. And it never will. He had used Egypt as a safe place for the raise of family and to multiply, but he wanted them out of there. So things began to tighten down. God had his hand on everything. Everything. And so uh, after Joseph died, he was 110 years old, but maybe 30 to 40 years later, there was a king that didn't know anything about Joseph or any about the elders or anything, rose. Now, maybe it wasn't 30 or 40 years. Maybe it was different, but I'm going by my timeline. And whether it's right or not, it doesn't matter. That happened. And... Uh, so they begin, task, they begin to put taskmasters because the Egyptians looked at them and said, look, if, if the Israelis is more of them than us, and if an enemy attacks us and they go with the enemy, we're defeated. So we've got to do something about this. So let's put taskmasters over them. So they started giving them hard bondage. They made them make only bricks and mortars. They made them work in the fields. They made anything that they wanted to do and done, they made them do it. It wasn't just making bread. And they didn't make the pyramids. I've heard, uh, I watched uh, National Geographic, and they was all saying about the Jews didn't make the pyramids. Well, I could have told them that. <laughs> Very simple. They made two cities for the Egyptians. And anyway, and when they started the Tasman, Moses didn't come along the next day. It was getting... They was there a while. They was getting in bondage for quite a spell. And they begin to cry unto God. And they begin to weep. And when they did, God will send a deliverer. And that deliverer was a Moses. And Moses was born at the time when things was really getting bad. That their taskmaster was really getting bad. Matter of fact, just before Moses was born, the Pharaoh told the midwives, any male child born, slay. That's pretty brutal. The midwives who feared God wouldn't. And when the Pharaoh said, why aren't you killing the male child, children? Why are you not doing it? What I'm telling you, because the Israeli women are far livelier than Egyptian women. And they're having the babies before we get there. So that saved their life and it spared the midwives. Matter of fact, the Bible, and I, never, I don't know what it really means, but he said they built, God built, had the 
houses built for it. So I don't know what that, maybe it's hospital, I don't know. But I, it wouldn't have been that. But anyway, that's what it says, so anyway. But anyway, that didn't work. So Farrell said, what we're going to do now, every male child that's born will chuck in Nile River and drown. That's what they, they was doing. So, you have uh, birth of Moses. He's born. His mother hides him for three months. He's, she's got to do something because there's officers in the Egyptian ar or in Egypt that's looking for these kids. There could be a bad neighbor that will squeal on you. Jealous neighbor, anything. She can keep him for three months. Maybe the officers are getting too close. Maybe she knows the neighbor's squealing on her. But anyway, for whatever reason, and you can imagine her heartbreak, building a basket of reeds and pitching it within and without and putting that in the Nile River and getting her daughter to watch that basket. You stay and you can see that basket and see what happens to it and put that in the river. And we know that uh, when Moses cried, the Pharaoh's daughter heard her cry, heard, the, heard him cry, and uh, she brought him out of the river, and she had mercy on him. She said, I want him. And Miriam, Moses' sister, older sister, she ran up and she said, look, you're, you just got this baby out of the river. Why don't you let me go find a midwife or find a, a mother to nurse her, nurse him, not her, him. And, and that's, what they, uh, that's what she did. She said, sure. So she went and got her mother, Moses' mother, to nurse her, nurse Moses. <coughs> now, it was common back then to nurse probably three years. But I found one place it said it could have been as long as six. Wow. So for three maybe more, the mother had Moses to tell him everything. This is your people. We're going to lose you. As soon as you're done nursing, you're going to go Egypt. So you've, we've got to drill into your head everything we can drill in now. This is not your people where you're going. And finally, Moses had to go. And for 40 years, Moses was in Egypt, in the house. And then... I've got to watch where I am here. I can't really see that good. Okay. We've got to get Moses out of there. After 40 years, Moses has made up his mind prior to going out and slaying the Egyptians. He goes out and sees the Egyptian and Israeli fighting, and he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Now, prior to that, Moses made up his mind. You can find the scripture in Hebrews that he is not going to uh, stay with sin for a season. He is going to serve his people and his God. He's made up, basically, that's not exactly what it says, but I have got it here. But anyway, I'm not going to use it. But anyway, he knew when he went out that he had made up his mind, I'm already going to go with Israelis. That wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. And the next day, he thought he'd get away with it. The next day, two Jews was fighting, and Moses come out, and he wasn't going to slay one, but I suppose he was trying to break it up. What's going on here? And they said, what are you going to do, slay us like you did the Egyptians yesterday? So Moses knew he was found out, and he had to go into the desert for 40 years. He went uh, into Midian. He became, he married a, a priest's daughter and had two sons in the desert. He was there for 40 years, and God... After 40 years, now Moses, when he went, I, perhaps before he went, maybe he thought himself that he was going to deliver the people. I don't know. Maybe he had an idea, I'll deliver the people. Maybe we'll start a rebellion. Maybe we'll fight our way out. I don't know what he was thinking. But it wasn't God's plan anyway. God wasn't in it. God called Moses, Moses after, in the desert after 40 years in a burning bush. The bush was on fire and it didn't burn. And he told Moses, he said, Take your shoes off, because the place you're standing is holy. And out of that burning bush, God called him to deliver his people. Moses didn't want to go. 
no, I don't want to go. And he said, they won't believe me. And he's probably thinking back, 40 years ago, I killed one of them. You know, I don't really want to show up. Everybody out is dead that was anything to do with me, but nevertheless. And anyway, uh, Moses, he said, who am I going to say sent me? I am one of the greatest scriptures in the Bible. I am that I am sent the Exodus, chapter 3, verse 8, or chapter. Tell them that I am has sent you, Exodus 3, 14 and 15. God's promise to Abraham way back in Genesis 15 and 14 was backed up in Exodus 3.22. When they went out, they did not go poor. They took the wealth of Egypt with them. That was a promise to Abraham. And when they went out, it was uh, the exact 430 years, the exact day they went out, 430 years to the day. Nobody but God could line that up. Nobody but God could line that up. But in a way, he still didn't want to go. They won't believe me. And he said, what's that in your hand? He said, it's a rod. He said, throw it down. So he threw it down and it became a snake. He said, pick it up. He picked it by the tail, back into a rod again. He said, stick your hand in your coat. Now pull it out. White lepros, leprosy. Leprosy doesn't get healed unless God heals it instantly. It takes years. He said, now stick it in again. When he pulled it out, it was pure, clean. He said, you're going to be able to turn uh, water, or water to blood. It's going to be a sign. Yes, <laughs> Moses. But he said, I can't talk. Well, God said, you will say what I tell you to say. No, I'm, I, I'm not a good talker. Well, Mo, God said, okay, I'll send Aaron. He is a good talker. But the problem is now, Moses, you've got to be a God to Aaron. In other words, I'm going to talk to you, then you've got to tell Aaron, and then he's got to pass it on. Before, it would have just been Moses' straight shot. Now it's Aaron. And uh, where am I? Not quite there yet. So finally, they, Moses and his wife and boys start towards Egypt. Uh, Moses had finally relented and was going to go. On his way, God almost killed him because he hadn't circumcised one of his boys. And his wife took a flint knife and circumcised the boy. I don't know how old he was, but he was way beyond what the age he should have been done. That was the uh, circumcision was God's thing from Abraham from then on. Now, as far as I know, the Jews still do that. We're circumcised now of the heart. But anyway, and... Moses recovered, whether it was sickness or whoever it was, I don't know, but he recovered and kept going. And they met Aaron, and they went in <coughs> to the Pharaoh. And they told Pharaoh what God had said. And Pharaoh said, who is God that I should pay any attention to? Him? He did not know God. He would before it was over, but he didn't then. And Moses... Um, Okay, the plague start. So Moses said, okay, if you don't want to, we're going to have a showdown here. He went in and out to Pharaoh many times, many different plagues, ten of them. And to me, it's almost 11, because when the Red Sea collapsed on the rest of the Egyptian army, it's almost the 11th plague, because they was wiped out. But anyway, Egypt worshipped many gods with human bodies, but different heads, bulls, frogs, lions, cobra, locusts, whatever. The plagues, and I'm going to go through these quite fast, the plagues, the Nile was turned to blood. Now, the Egyptians worshipped the Nile as the father of life. Moses turned the Nile into blood when Pharaoh was at the riverside, but 
the magicians of Pharaoh did the same thing, but were not able to remove it. Now Paul names those two in Timothy, in the book of Timothy, or 2 Timothy. Paul, Paul names them. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 8. Janus and Jambres, they were the Egyptian magicians, and they must have been quite powerful. And don't ask me how they could change water to blood. I don't know. And then the next thing they, they did, they brought frogs, or Moses brought frogs out of the river, and they were deified as gods because the croaking of the frogs was assured of a good harvest. So the Egyptians worshipped them. God was going to take every one of their gods and destroy it. That's what he was doing. And the, the magicians did the same thing, but again, they couldn't remove them. The next thing, Moses touched the ground. Now, this is over a period of days, but I'm not going to be a period of days. And he brought lice. Now, I think it's, this book says that you could change lice to gnats or even mosquitoes. I don't think so. I'm staying with lice because it's small. They're on the ground. They get into everything. Drive you pretty near nuts. I never had them, but I know people that has. But anyway, but when Moses made uh, the lice, the Egyptians couldn't match it. Simple, very simple life. They couldn't do it. And they told the Pharaoh, said, this is the finger of God. He was beginning to know. And then the next, uh, flies, flies on everything. It was a plague. If you ever been, people ever remember those flies that they brought to take the, the spruce budworm down one time? They were everywhere. They was down at our camp with a lot of cedar. If you hung white sheets out, there was black stops all over. All over you, everything. So I can't imagine what it would have been like, a bunch of flies. But anyway, the next curse was uh, there was cows, bulls, rams, and goats all got disease and died, a lot of them. Anything that was in the open died. If you look in Revelation, a lot of these plagues is coming on the same thing. You've got boils, frogs, uh, all plagues. Anyway, next thing was boils. They threw ashes into the heavens, and boils came on the man and beast, so bad that the magicians couldn't even come out at the beckon of Pharaoh. It was so sore. By the way, after the lice, when it flies hit, Israel never got any more plagues. That was it. All the rest of Goshen was plague-free. They never, they never got any boils. Next thing was hailstorm and, and fire. It filled the land the bar, and uh, it destroyed anything that was up. Uh, if you was out in it, you died. If your animals was out in it, they died. If you think that hailstorm is bad, check Revelation 8 and 9 and Revelation 16 and 21. Far worse. And next thing was locusts. They would pray to locusts because they were scared of them. If locusts could eat its own weight daily. If you had one square mile of locusts, it would be between 100 and 200 million locusts in one wow. square mile. And a swarm of them would maybe be 400 square miles. They had it worse. It's just un unbelievable. And the next one was darkness, and it was so dark you could touch it. That was the 10th plague, or the ninth plague. And that's, it couldn't go. And all the plagues, are about all the plagues are found again in Rev Revelation. The tenth plague is the death of the firstborn from Pharaoh's mansion to the dungeon, every firstborn including cattle. Now the Passover for Israel, Israelis was a feast that's going on, was, was going to go on, and it's going to be a time to remember. It's when God brought them out of Egypt and bondage. They had to slay a lamb and eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. If one family couldn't eat it all, you could invite a neighbor, but it had to be your lamb. It couldn't be anybody else's. Nothing could be left in the morning. If you didn't finish it all, it had to be burnt. And that lamb represents next is Christ. He's the Passover lamb. 
he was without blemish. He had, to be, he had to present that lamb four days to the priest to make sure it had no blemish. They looked over for four days. Jesus came on the Sabbath to the temple without blemish, but there was no chief priest would examine him. Pilate made the statement, I find no fault in him. Imagine a Gentile Pilate telling the Lamb of God, you're pure, is what he was saying. No bones would be broken. No bones would be broken in that lamb. No bones would be broken in Christ. You take the blood from that lamb and you strike it on the doorpost and both sides and over the top. And if you didn't do that, the death angel would come in and slay your firstborn. So you put it on there outside. You did not go outside. Once you put that blood on there, you stayed in. You fully dressed, shoes on your feet, Packed and ready to go. That's what the rapture is. Ready to go. <laughs> uh, when the firstborn died, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron that night and said, Go with your children. Serve the Lord. Take your flocks and your herds and bless me. You realize who God was. In Exodus 12, 31, 36. The Egyptians heard the people to go and lent them jewels, gold, and silver as the promise to Abraham. They entered Egypt with probably around 70. They left with around 600,000 men, plus the women and children. A mixed multitude also left with them. God went before them after a short while in a pillar of fire. I've done that chart. By day, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. Okay. Pharaoh had second thoughts and sent his army, his horsemen and chariots after the children of Israel and went their backs to Pharaoh's army and the front was the Red Sea. The, the people of God began to question, what are we doing here? You can say, well, I wouldn't have said that. Well, I would have. <laughs> Unless I could swim across that river or that lake. Or... And so it's commonly believed today that it's the Reed Sea and not the Red Sea. Forget it, it's the Red Sea. It's not the Reed Sea. In fact, I read one article about it. They said why it was the Reed Sea because at the same time there was a volcano in the Mediterranean and put a tidal wave in. That's why the water was so hot. Forget it. The Red Sea. If anybody tells you otherwise, plug your ears. <laughs> they crossed the Red Sea. Moses, the same rod. There was one part to he swallowed the snake. I'm not going back and bother with that now. I just remembered that. But anyway, we'll forget that part. I can't get it all. Uh, after he put his army, Moses, the people were, Moses held the rod over the Red Sea. God parted the waters. Moses didn't. God did. God put a wall of water on the right hand and on the left hand. And the east wind blew and it dried the ground under the sea. So they walked over in dry ground. Not possible, humanly. And they went over and they scurried across. And if I read another article, they could have walked 5,000 wide across. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they said. I was reading the wet and they said they could have walked 5,000 abreast. But a lot of people crossed fast. When the uh, Egyptians tried to cross, follow them, God looked them out of the cloud. He said, yeah, knock the tires off the chariots. That's what he did. <laughs> As they kept coming, if I'd have been driving the chariot, my tires flew off for no reason. And I looked everybody around, everybody else was going off. I think I'd have hit her back. But anyway, the whole Egyptian army, everything was gone. Once. Jews was across, God just closed the water, and they all, nobody survived. That was the separation of the Jewish people from Egypt to the Promised Land. For the first day, they was in the Promised Land, and that sea, that was their baptism, a cloud in that sea, and that separated them. Jesus' baptism 
separates us today. Same. That's what it is. So we are separated. We're no longer of this world. We've repented. We're baptized. We are not of this world. We're a new creature. And so are they. They were home. We're on the way home. Uh, okay. They crossed the Red Sea. And there was a lot of rejoicing, dancing, shouting. And Dale would say, what did he tell me one time at Plast Rock at Sunday night? They have, uh, they don't have preaching usually. They have a lot of jumping and shouting and dancing and testimonies. And I don't know what all, he, he, put, he said what it was. Something like a party, but I can't remember now. But anyway, that's what they had. They had a great time. Wow, we're out, we're free. They hit her. Starting going across the, into the desert, and they hit a place, Mare. And there was water there, but the water was bitter. What did the people do? Well, here we are. You got us across the Red Sea, all right. Now we're in the desert, and the water we can't drink. Now, doesn't that sound like human? It sounds like me. And Mo, or God said, Moses, take that branch off that tree and chuck it in the water and that'll purify the water. God was beginning to show them he's bringing them home. That's what he, uh, they went farther and they got worried about food. That's when God sent manna and quail. Now manna was, I don't know how they picked it up. They picked up about a quart a day. That would last till they went out. That manna lasted until they went Across the Jordan River. And the, the cloud and the fire of the Lord stayed with them until they crossed the Jordan River. Forty years. Um, I'm, this may not be exact order, but I'm going to put it how I've got it. Twelve, I've just got it wrote down on the side here. Twelve sp spies were sent into the promised land. I only know two names, Joshua and Caleb. Anybody can tell me any other name of the other ten? So ten Twenty-two, I don't even know if it's in the Bible. Two went in, and they was in there for 40 days to spy out the land, to look her over. When they come out, they had a, uh, two men was carrying a bunch of grapes on a staff between the shoulders. I like grapes. I like green grapes, and I like red grapes. And we have quite a few grapes. But I can't imagine having a cluster of grapes on a pole. Even that would be enough. And when they come out, Caleb and Joshua, and I could see them. We can take them. We can take them. We can take them fence cities. We can take that country. And the other ten said, no, we can't. We're like grasshoppers to them giants. Caleb said, we can take them. He would take them. Joshua. But who did they believe? They believed the ten. And okay, I'm still coming. Brazen serpent. That's that's something that's mystified me for years. When they uh the ten, so after the ten said no, the people agreed with the ten. And God pronounced the judgment. It's okay. Anybody over 20 years old is not going into the promised land. And you're going to be in this wilderness for, the, for 40 years. You're going to be wandering around. You're going to wander here for 40 years. That's just how it is. Because you didn't believe that I could take the promised land. They, uh, why didn't God just take them all right bang? Because he had to train everybody that was under 20. You had to be shepherds. You had to be carpenters. You had to be priests. You had to be learned, all these things. You had to get strength. So he let them, anybody under 20 was going to go in the promised land. Anybody over wasn't. Over wasn't. Sent 12 spies. Two said go. Ten said no. The ten that said no died. So, God can be quite harsh, quite quick sometimes. And considering when they came from Egypt, there was not one feeble among them 
according to Psalms 105, 37, Israel was in a sorry state. You know, the clothes on their back wouldn't wear out, and the shoes and the feet didn't wear out for 40 years. It's quite something. Um, the brazen serpent, at different times, they would rebel against God, and when God do it, he would do different things. One time, uh, a couple of fellows thought, well, he said, we don't got to listen to Aaron and Moses. Who's Aaron and Moses? God said, fine. He opened the ground up. They fell in. End of discussion. 250 more rebels that was kind of agreeing with them, he took care of them. Another time it was 14,700. He took care of them. Don't go against the man of God. I don't care who you are. If the man of God is right, in standing with God and preaching the word of God, you stand with him. You stand behind him, but you don't stand against him because you're in dangerous ground if you do. But another time, they rebelled against something. I can't remember just exactly what it is, but brazen serpent. And fiery snakes went around and biting. Anybody that was bit died. And Aaron ran right into the crowd. He said, we got to get this, stop this. So God said, Moses, you make a brazen serpent of brass and you hang it on a pole and anybody who looks at that will live. That has bothered me always. Why did God tell them to make an idol and hang it on a pole and to look at it and they'd live? That never bother anybody else. <laughs> didn't make sense to me. And I asked God many times. And finally he said, God, and I, the, the brazen serpent had nothing to do with the healing. Nothing. That was just, the, in fact, Hezekiah had to destroy it years later because they was worshiping it. Yep. Right. What, and you know what God said to me? I said, why would you do that, God? Why would you make that, look in that brass? He said, it shouldn't have. It shouldn't have healed anybody. But because I said it would, it did. It's the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And that's why uh, that healed. And Jesus even referenced it as the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man. And I, I thought that is sound. But you stop and think, if I tell you that a man on a cross died 2,000 years ago, that it would save every soul that would turn to him. You could say, it shouldn't. <laughs> but because God's word said it would, it does. It does. Mm -hmm. and that's how it is. That's mm -hmm. the coriation. That's the thing right there. It's the word of God. Uh, where are we now? Twelve surprise. I guess I got a little bit ahead there. Okay, the law and the tabernacle. Now we're coming into the law and the tabernacle. And this is... I can't go through all this law. There's, there's a lot of it. Better wait here a little bit. When he went up into Mount Sinai, you know, some people say Mount Sinai, some people say Mount Hor, both one and the same mountain. They're not two different mountains. I've, I've read articles and I've seen uh, videos. I've rented trying to describe it. Sinai is not where he went. He went to Mount Hor, and it showed Mount Hor was blackened on the top and split rock where the water come out. So, I don't know. You figure it out. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And when I found out Sinai and, and the same mountain, so, so I, I give it up. I can't be bored. But anyway, the laws, and the laws uh, that, that God gave Moses first, and it was a lot going on before this, because on Mount Sinai, we'll say, God come down on the mountain and he, he told the people, he said, Moses, tell the people not to touch the mountain or the, or the beast. Nobody touch that mountain when I'm down on If they do, they'll die. There was smoke and fire, thunder and lightning, and the people was actually scared. But when and Moses went up, and some of the priests went up actually for ways, not to uh, exactly to see God, but actually Moses and Aaron and 70 elders Actually, from a distance, I was reading that just before I come here in the Bible, they actually saw God in the distance, and he was walking on uh, 
like a sidewalk of some precious metal, or I can't remember. And, uh, but anyway, only Moses went up to talk to God. And God gave him the Ten Commandments. He wrote them on the finger of God on a table of stone. And Moses was up there without eating and drinking for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he came down, Aaron, people, he was up there so long, they said, well, he's died. He's not coming down. So we got to have a God to take us out of here. So what do they do? They took the gold and silver, crushed it up, made a molten image of, of a calf. When Moses came down, he actually threw the two tables of stone down, the Ten Commandments, and broke them. Yeah. And he, he asked Aaron, he said, what's this? Well, he said, we threw the gold in the fire, and that's what popped out. Yeah. Yeah. We, we believe that. We means won't. But anyway, the t Ten Commandments, and then he gave a lot of other. They was there probably over a year, a year or better, getting the law. It just wasn't a five-minute happening. There were moral laws, the right conduct. There were civil laws, your rights and duties as citizens. And there are ceremonial laws, religious ceremonies and rituals. It was a holy people. You're going to be separated unto God. You're going to worship one true God. The tabernacle is going to be the place to worship now. You're going to have priests, and they're going to interpret the law. They're going to offer sacrifices. There's going to be Sabbath, and there's going to be special feast days. There's two types of offerings, bloodless and blood. Bloodless is the first flute, ties, drink, meat. The blood will be domestic animals, clean, perfect, no blemish, no wild or unclean. One way for sin is when you sin ignorantly or in weakness. Number two, trespass. You violate the law. And it's very easy to do. If you touch a dead body, you're in violation of the law. So you've got to be out of the camp and clean. But anyway, burnt, it's got to be a burnt offering. is complete self-surrender to the one true God, and it must be completely burnt. And the fourth one is peace. You ate part yourself to show your communion with God. Probably that's all listed there, is it? There's your Ten Commandments. Have I got time to read them? You guys can read them, I guess. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any un, unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother, that the days may be long upon the earth. That's quite a statement. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covered. If we could live by them Ten Commandments, we wouldn't need many more laws. We put all we need. Now, I'm going to go into the tabernacle. That's just what I covered, wasn't it? Good. Now this is how they, the Israelis was camped. You have your tabernacle here, your altar, your brazen laver. You have your God over it. You have your priest. You have these people here. They worked tearing the, or the uh, tents and setting everything up. They carried it. Only certain ones could touch anything. And it was these fellows. And then all your... your uh, tribes was around it, east, west, north, and south. And if you look at the tribes, the way they're numbered, it would look like a cross if you was, and uh, if we had a, one of the little things today and looked at it, it would look like a cross. The way the top, bottom, and two sides were the same length. Which is quite something. Any, any questions you can get me after. Now, God dwells with his people. This is what he wants. The 12 tribes, Moses and Aaron, 
Um, the brazen altar here. That's where your sacrifice was offered. That's a blood sacrifice. I've heard people say, I wish I was under the law. Got no idea what they're saying. Could you imagine dragging a big bull up in here for Brother Farrell to, to slay? But this was where your, your animal was slaughtered, right here. And for you today, that is repentance. The blood of Jesus Christ covers you when you repent. That's where it's at. That isn't the end of it, but that covers it. And that's what I felt when my sins went. And I cleaned inside. It was his blood because I said the simple word, God, I've had enough. And here, and then this here, the priests had to wash. They had to wash their hands and their feet. If they didn't wash, they died. People tell me they don't think you have to be baptized. I said, what about the scripture that says baptism does now save us? I said, I am not going in front of Jesus without being baptized if I know to do so. I don't care. I will never tell you it's not essential. Never. And I'll never tell you that the Holy Spirit is not essential. It's up to God who he lets in, not up to Terry. But I'm going to tell you the guarantee. And here, this represents baptism, and it's in the name of Jesus. And then we have in here the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the light. This was gone, gone all the, every night, and the tr priest trimmed it in the morning. And then curtains, and then the holiest of holies where God dwelt. That's where the tabernacle was. That's where the, the two... Second Ten Commandments were the stones that Moses had to make the stones this time. God wrote it, but Moses had to make the stones this time. Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna. Now the manna, you can only keep it one day. If you didn't eat all the manna, get rid of it. Because if you kept it, it stunk and it was full of worms. Except Sabbath, before the Sabbath, Friday. Sabbath on the Jews was Saturday. You took two, two loads. And that didn't rot and stink the next day. Talk about God. Amen. And so they, uh, that was in here. Now this, to me, represents Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Our bread of life. Today, this here. Alder of incense, that is our prayer. That is your prayer. That's what that priest offered. Um, John the Baptist's father, that's what he did. That was his job. And no matter what, he did it. And I can tell you, I heard Brother Woodward speak on that, what he did. Even though what he knew, he still went in the daily. We have to got to pray. Daily, if you can. And I wish I could tell you I pray every day. I try to, but I don't always pray the way I should every day. But I wish I did. But I try. I'm getting better at it. And sometimes I even go for weeks and don't miss a day. But then I'll blow it. And I don't. But anyway, you've got to commune with God. You've got to commune with God. And it is no fancy prayer. Talk to the Lord like you're talking, like I'm talking. Uh, I was talking to uh, Reed Perry, I think it is, the other day, or Sunday night, and he was telling me about his wife died and his son was murdered, or daughter was murdered, and his daughter died, but there was three deaths in his family. He was telling me about that. And he was feeling pretty bad, and I said, well, Reed, did you tell God about it? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, tell God you've been kicked in the head. You need some help. He said, you wouldn't say that? I said, yes, you would. That's what you've been done. You've been kicked. You're feeling bad. Tell them. Tell them how you feel. Tell them. You don't got to mess around and say, oh, great God. Tell them how you feel. He is a great God. He's a wonderful God, and he wants to hear, and he'll look after. I'm not saying he's going to raise them, but he'll give a peace in you that you cannot understand. And this part, 
I'd say Jesus Christ is the light of the world. But he's in us, making us the light of the world. Right. And we are not to be hid. Mm -hmm. You don't put a light on a hill and put a basket over it. No we've got to let our light shine. Wherever we go, where, anytime we go, we've got to let our light shine. That's what we're for. That's, what, that's our job here. And you, you have to try to do it. Uh, there's things I love to do for, for God. And I'm not a very talented person. I can't sing. I'm not a preacher. But I love to work for the Lord. And I just look around, what can I do? And here a while ago, he laid on me, visit people. And not just you. He wanted me to get people to go with me. So I have got Danny Robinson, probably wore out. <laughs> but I'm going from how we're going around house to house and praying for people and listening to their testimony. We're not coming to preaching. We're just listening to your story. We want to hear your testimony. We want to hear what God's done for you. And then we pray, we'll anoint with oil if you want us to. And I'm getting blessed, and we're getting better blessing than they are, but they're enjoying it. And it's just something simple. God has worked for everybody to do. And this is the holiest of holies. This is the bottom part was where I said the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and the manna is. Up here is the mercy seat. God dwells in the mercy seat. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He's the one that dwells here. He is above the law. My blood will take care of your sin. You just give it to me. That's all we have to do. And then keep on keeping on. Jesus is a mercy seat. And I heard one preacher say one time, Brother Becton, he said, oh, Uzziah, when he reached up and touched that ark that was fallen, it shouldn't have been on the cart anyway, it should have been being carried by the priest. When he touched it, the state that God slew him. But he said, if he had just reached higher, and touched the mercy seat, he might have survived. Yeah. Who knows? It's, uh, what have I got now? Six. I'm pretty near, I'm pretty near done, and I'm just about on time. Here we have here, it's, and I can't go into this too much, but the death of Jesus Christ. He gave us life when we were dying, dead. No hope. He's our hope. His resurrection. We can talk about his death. Don't bother putting him on a cross on a wall because he's not there no more. He resurrected. He came out victorious. Yes, he did. The, what does the song go? The sun rose at sunrise. Jesus Christ came out of that tomb. And now he's our chief high priest. He's our Holy Ghost giver. He is the spirit in us. And people have confused that. There's one God. One and God. that great God took on flesh. And died on that cross. And I think of that a lot. I say, God, how? Your great holiness. Could you take my sin onto that cross and die and go into hell for me? My second death. You took it. I don't even got to be there. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's what he done. And he is ever living to save us. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. He loves you. Yes. And he will save you. Yes. He, will, he will do everything. Move mountains for you. And I'm done. <laughs> Not going to go any further. That's chart seven. That's the last one.